I think there's great comfort in knowing that when we get sick, and, and many of us will need this, that we can go to a hospital. And of course, when we get very sick, critically ill, it's also of great comfort to know that we have intensive care or critical care units who will look after us. <coughs> This is a patient of mine who's currently in the hospital, who's fighting for his life. Um, you can see him here, he's on vital support, he's got a ventilator to support his lungs, he's got a dialysis machine to support his kidneys, he's got infusion pumps supporting his circulation, he's even getting a blood transfusion. He may or may not survive, many don't. When you look at the leading cause of death, in intensive care units around the world, and it doesn't matter what critical illness it is, is it meningitis, pneumonia, peritonitis, massive trauma, hemorrhagic shock, whatever the critical illness, uh, the, the leading cause of death in, in these intensive care units is multiple organ failure. The progressive failure of vital organs despite intensive support. And really, multiple organ failure has been called a plague of modern medicine. We do very well in, in, in supporting life, but ultimately, our organ systems fail. And this is a huge challenge, both clinically and economically, to our healthcare services. Progress wasn't made with the bubonic plague until we understood what caused it. And we're not going to make progress with multiple organ failure until we have an idea about what's driving it. And so this question has, has troubled me. What is it that drives multiple organ failure? You know, unless we understand that, we're not gonna be able to develop specific targeted therapies that will make a difference in these different organ systems. We're gonna have to rely on organ support while the critical illness runs its course. We really need a new approach. Uh, in our fight to, to deal with multiple organ failure, we need a new understanding. Now, I want to take you on a journey, a pretty exciting journey for us. I hope you, you enjoy coming with me on this because um, I think we've, we've found something that's worth considering here. There are two observations that I want to share with you. That's where good science starts from, observing what's taking place in front of you. The first is this, and I apologize if, if this is, but this is what I face. When I open a patient's abdomen with critical illness, I'm faced with intestine that doesn't look well, it's off color. It doesn't matter whether it's septic shock or acute pancreatitis, the intestine has a limitation to its blood supply. We call this intestinal ischemia. It's when the blood is in short supply. And this can lead to gangrene, to perforation, to peritonitis, even to death. And this is a common finding for all critical illness. And I think we can understand this because of the redistribution of blood. It's really like robbing Peter to pay Paul, and this happens in our body. We prioritize certain organs over other organs. And so from organs that don't work continuously, like organs of locomotion or of digestion, we reroute or redistribute blood uh, to organs that do work continuously and are vital for life, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys. And you know, there's a consequence to this. You know, we, have to, we do pay a price for intestinal ischemia, and, and it's really not been well recognized. But you know what happens when you have intestinal ischemia is that the tight junctions between cells break down. All of that bacteria, the toxins within your gut, can leak through the wall of the intestine into the body. We call this process translocation. Now, the second observation is that despite whatever critical illness is there, there appears to be a predictable sequence of organ failure. Why is that? Nobody told me why that was, and I've been intrigued by that. The organs fall like dominoes, first the heart, then the lungs, then the kidneys, and so there's a remarkably similar pattern going on here. There must be a fundamental common pathway here that we've yet to discover. Now this is a little bit harder to explain, but I want to take you back to your classrooms at science, talk about the circulation. You recall that the heart pumps through arteries that are always coated red. Blood is returned to the heart in vessels called veins, uh, coated blue. What happens between these two? Well, the arteries branch and branch and branch and branch until they get down to very tiny vessels called capillaries. So tiny that the individual cells can only go through them single file. 
And this branching takes place so that the blood supply can get really close to individual cells to supply them with what they need to function, to take away waste, things that they don't need. And so you have, at this level, a, a, a very busy interchange, glucose, Fluid, metabolites come out of the vessels, bathe the cells, the cells take up what they want, release what they don't want. But fluid also comes out of these vessels. 90% of the, of the fluid that goes out of the vessels at the capillary level are returned to the blood by osmosis, but 10% doesn't, and this is important. Where does that 10% go? Well, that 10% is taken up by the lymphatics the forgotten circulation. And so if you want to put it diagrammatically, it looks like this, where you have in white, coded white now, the lymphatics, which take away the excess fluid from the capillary beds and return it to the circulation to maintain your blood volume. On a quiet day, three liters of fluid per day goes up that channel. Now, if you come back to the intestine, the intestine that was ischemic, there's a capillary bed there too, and excess fluid from there, again, dumps directly back into the circulation. I'll show you how. Blood that comes from the intestine, however, the blue blood coming out of the intestine, goes through the liver, which filters, detoxifies, processes whatever's in that blood. But the lymph doesn't, it bypasses the liver. More realistically, this is what it looks in, in, in diagram from Netta. You can see very fine lymphatic vessels coming out of the, the intestine, coalescing. You can see some lymph nodes. They coalesce in the cisterna chile, and then the thoracic duct ascends through the thorax to ultimately empty the blood in the neck, in the blood vessel immediately prior to the heart. And I think this is the clue this is a thing we've been looking for because the organs that are exposed to that lymph, first the heart, then the lungs, and then the kidneys are the very organs which tend to fail first. So we have two observations, in, in, and, and these observations have led us to frame a hypothesis. So this hypothesis for us now has been guiding our researchers that in critical illness, Lymph draining from intestinal ischemia or ischemic intestine drives multiple organ failure. Actually, how I see it is more like this, where you have raw, untreated sewer dumping directly into the lake. So I want to give you two experiments which I think help us to understand something of the importance of lymph. These are experiments that I think are going to underpin a new approach to our, to our thinking and our treatment of multiple organ failure. Now, both experiments use acute pancreatitis, a disease that I'm particularly interested in, as the model of critical illness. And in both experiments, we need to find, needed to find a way of collecting the lymph from the intestine. So this is what we did. We put a very small inflatable cuff around the artery that supplies the intestine so that we could actually determine the degree of ischemia. And as a consequence of that, we're able to demonstrate that the small bowel indeed became ischemic. The third thing we needed to do was to place a very fine tube into the duct, the lymphatic duct, exiting the intestine so we could collect the lymph coming from the ischemic intestine. So we're ready then for our first experiment. And we asked the question, can this lymph coming from the intestine actually make acute pancreatitis worse? So we set up an acute pancreatitis model. Here you can see a very small cannula going through the duodenum into the pancreas, through which we placed a bile salt, which we know gave a predictable mild pancreatitis. The next thing we did is we took the pancreas, still, still alive, uh, in the whole animal to the microscope and through fluorescent intravital microscopy, we could actually watch the capillary blood flow in real time. So this is it. What you see here is normal capillary blood flow. The red cells are fluorescing green, and you can see them, if you look very carefully, whizzing through that capillary network. That's the normal, that's what's happening in every capillary bed in your, in your body right now. Now, when we gave acute pancreatitis, I think you'll agree that you can see a very significant change. There's a slowdown in the capillary blood flow in acute pancreatitis. Well, what happened when we added lymph just into the peripheral circulation? What happened at the pancreas level is dramatic. The capillary blood flow virtually stopped. 
And if you want to look at it graphically, you can see at the top there acute pancreatitis, capillary blood flow is maintained, acute pancreatitis a 20% drop. But when you give the lymph, the capillary blood flow just gets worse and worse and worse. And so it's no surprise that when we looked at the pancreas after this, the pancreas had died, areas had necrosed, uh, mild pancreatitis had become severe pancreatitis just with the addition of lymph into the peripheral circulation. So I think the second experiment asks a question that's probably more important, and that is, can lymph from the intestine cause organ failure? And in particular, heart failure, that first organ encountered. We used a rib, a rig like this, which looks very complicated, but if you look carefully, you'll see a little heart in the middle of that. We can control the inflow and the outflow. Uh, we can measure the pressure in the wall of the heart. We can look at what the coronary vessels produce. We can pace the heart and keep the heart rate under control. It's a highly controlled model, and we can test various things on the heart for up to five hours at a time. What it looks like is beautiful. A little heart pumping at about 300 beats a minute. And uh, in this model, we can test the effect of lymph on cardiac function. Well, what happens normally in the heart can be seen here. As you increase the filling pressure, that is blood returning to the heart, the heart normally responds by that, by actually pumping out more per contraction. The stroke volume goes up. And so you get this classic starling curve, as it's called. When we added the lymph, there was an immediate and dramatic reduction in the ability to do that. These hearts started to fail. That's the first time that that has ever been demonstrated. So, we have two experiments uh, that have shown that lymph from mildly ischemic intestine is toxic to two organs. Acute pancreatitis got worse, became severe, and secondly, we induced heart failure with this lymph. Now, these are only two experiments, and a, a lot of work still needs to be done. We haven't translated this through into clinical practice yet, but it, for me, it's extremely exciting because for the first time, we have the opportunity to develop new strategies of treatment in the attempt to reduce the toxicity of, ischemic, of lymph from the ischemic intestine. So, just to finish briefly, we've got two strategies. Just want to share these with you. The first, obviously, is to work out what's in that lymph. I mean, this lymph has gone from a benign fluid to something that's very toxic to organs. What is it? Well, that's a major undertaking which we've got HRC funding for, and we have a big program looking at the composition of mesenteric lymph, trying to determine what has changed in the toxic lymph. And so the first strategy really for treatment would be obviously to alter the composition of toxic lymph to make it more benign. That's a long-term project. The second strategy is much more, much more simple conceptually. That is, why don't we just tie off the thoracic duct and prevent the, the, that lymph getting to the circulation and then onto the heart and the lungs and the kidneys? Well, we've done that experiment. And the results were that if we ligated the thoracic duct, we completely abrogated, completely prevented the cardiac failure that we had demonstrated that lymph was causing. It's a pretty dramatic finding. So, coming back to my patient, although I don't have today something specific I can offer him, I think these experiments offer real hope. I think they help us understand an unrecognized driver of multiple organ failure has been there in front of us all this time. We just haven't recognized it. And so in, in taking this work forward, I really believe we've developed a new paradigm in our fight against multiple organ failure. Thank you.